as we've been continuing our focus on the Brahma Viharas, keep remembering that the Brahma Viharas are unconditional. Unconditional, that these qualities are felt toward all beings, all experiences, and meaning not dependent on circumstances. That no matter what is happening, we can abide in kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. This can feel really radical to me, especially with joy. That if joy is truly unconditional, I can practice it whether what is happening is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Those three categories of experience or feeling tone are what the Buddha taught as Vedana. That at every moment of experience, at every sense door, what is arising and received has a pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone that we can't control. And so why is it important to focus on Vedana? It really conditions everything. It's that first drop from which everything builds. The more mindful and aware we are of when pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone is occurring at any of the sense doors, the more mindful and aware we can be of our habitual reactions to that, that domino effect that can flow from just one moment of unpleasant or pleasant. And we often don't notice Vedana until it has already conditioned that whole cascade of reactions. And so coming back to the Brahma Viharas, let's think about joy. If joy is truly unconditional, we can practice it with pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And I got excited as I thought about this because it felt like, okay, there are unique challenges and opportunities with each. And the Buddha actually talks about this. What gets purified as we work with our relationship to pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Just as Lee mentioned in her talk on generosity, the Brahma Viharas are purifying. We are meant to see and come up against our blocks and see how conditional these qualities often are and feel in our lives and beings. Here's what the Buddha said about what gets purified in working with Vedana. In the case of pleasant feelings, O monks, the underlying tendency to desire should be given up. In the case of painful feelings, the underlying tendency to resistance, aversion, should be given up. In the case of neither painful nor pleasant feelings, the underlying tendency to ignorance should be given up. So we hear desire, aversion, and ignorance. So let's look at each and just explore some of the opportunities and challenges in them. With pleasant, pleasant feeling tone, we might think this is a pretty easy place to feel joy, right? This is where we're used to feeling it and conditioned to access it. And my sense is that one of the first challenges in abiding in joy in relation to pleasant is do we even notice the pleasant, right? We're so often habituated to noticing the negative, the unpleasant, we usually don't register pleasant that may be occurring. So this can be a great doorway, inviting ourselves to attune to pleasant, like breeze on our skin, the color of the sky. And then The second challenge, which we've talked about a bit already, is to give ourselves permission to drink that in and appreciate it, to have permission to experience some uplift, and then certainly the challenge to do that without clinging, 
not identifying, not getting lost in desire, and not thinking we made the pleasant arise so we can control whether it continues, working with letting it go as the pleasant shifts as it will. I think about this a bit like that metaphor of holding a bird lightly in the hand, really connecting, appreciating with it. And when it flies away, it's gone. So this is how we allow joy and wonder and appreciation with pleasant while balancing that with the purif purifying the energy of desire and clinging. And then unpleasant is a little more difficult. With the unpleasant, we're probably not going to orient initially to joy. And it's important to remember that we don't make the pleasant, the unpleasant pleasant by practicing joy. But we may see that we have more choices than initially seem available. So first, I thought about the relief that we can feel in being able to be with the experience of unpleasant or painful and not resisting it. And Jay and David especially focused a lot on this in their talks. The joy of being able to accompany and be with our struggles, our resistance, and the freedom in allowing that to be here because it is part of life. And that's that breaking down of resistance and aversion. And then as we do that, we also often see that the unpleasant or difficult is usually not only unpleasant or difficult, right? Our minds can create a story so that when something is unpleasant, suddenly it's all bad and that's all that's happening. One example of this for me is that waiting in lines or in traffic is often unpleasant for me. And I've realized that actually what's difficult and unpleasant is the mind state of impatience. Standing in line or sitting in traffic, the physical sensory experience of that is usually not unpleasant. I can relax as I stand. I can listen to music in the car. And so as I've realized that, oh, it's, it's the mind door experiencing an impatience, that's unpleasant, it has an unpleasant feeling tone. I can acknowledge that, breathe with that, and maybe turn to the non-unpleasant aspects of the experience, which brings a little softening, and suddenly it's a different experience. With more long-term painful or emotionally difficult experiences, by working with our relationship to them, we may see that there's an opportunity for deep learning and a deeper kind of joy that we may have not had not realized is possible. And this really came to light for me recently in a conversation with my Sangha, where one of the members was with and helping a dear friend who was in the dying process. And she was acknowledging that in so many ways, she didn't want to be there. It was really, really painful. She didn't want to be experiencing it. And there was that resistance. And she was also acknowledging that she wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And there was a joy in her generous offering of time and energy to her friend. There was a deep connection to her friend and admiration of the friend's resilience. There was learning and appreciation of being with the truth that we all die. And it hit me that there was a kind of, a kind of joy, <laughs> not maybe the way we normally would think about it, in the midst, right alongside the pain and grief. She wasn't using it as a spiritual bypass. She was feeling the grief and she was connecting to the deep appreciation and gratitude and love. And as she talked about it with us, 
I could feel the resistance and aversion shifting and seeming kind of purified. And then with neutral, (laughs) that which is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. This can be so easy to skip over. We often don't even notice neutral in our world that is so addicted to agitation and intensity. So how might we connect to and abide in joy in relation to the neutral? I've noticed recently for myself that it takes about 20 minutes for me to settle in meditation practice, that long before even I'm settled. And as soon as things actually quiet, there is this visceral desire to be done. Like as soon as the agitation settles, some part of me just disengages and doesn't want to be there anymore. And I think this is often how we relate to neutral. We think what is happening isn't worthy of our attention or time and is not worthy of being known. And that's the ignorance that gets purified in building a joyful relationship with it right? When we're disinterested, looking for something a bit more exciting, joy is not possible. There's so much we don't notice. Thinking just about a brown bird, a squirrel that we might kind of barely notice or have neutral feelings toward. But when we actually take a moment to connect, there's an opportunity to notice a lot of subtlety Often when we slow down and open to being with neutrality, things that may seem boring, we realize are actually alive with variation. There's also, I was thinking about also uh, a meal of white rice, right? That at the taste door, that might seem a little boring or bland or neutral. And we might just then be disinterested and not engage in the whole meal. But if we really connect to the rice, we might see the soil and the sunshine and the people who planted and harvested it. And all of a sudden, there is this sort of incredible realization that I can't believe I'm able to eat this, right? And there can be some gratitude in that. And finally, another opportunity for joy in building a relationship with neutral is that neutral can have an element of calm to it. It's sort of devoid of drama. And we can appreciate and abide in that. The simplicity of it can be a doorway to joy in that way. Maybe not fireworks joy, but that kind of quiet connection, ease. And in that way, ignorance is purified. So as we work with pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, we see that there are different ways into accessing joy. With pleasant, we can orient to receiving, connecting, appreciating, and letting go. Purification of desire and the joy of gratitude and non-attachment. With unpleasant, we can orient to the full experience versus just the pain. There's that purification of aversion and resistance, and we touch into the joy of including all, allowing, accompanying, even caring for our pain and learning from it. And with neutral, we can orient to a bit more interest, curiosity, There's that purification of ignorance as we touch into the joy of seeing the worthiness in all that is here as we connect to calm and ease. And then with all of these, as we work with them, we may even begin to feel the joy and freedom of non-attachment to whether things are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. That joyful equanimity. And this is actually what the Buddha described as the highest joy, a mind that is free from greed, 
hatred, and delusion, that naturally radiant mind-heart that is kind, compassionate, joyful, and equanimous. He describes that as the greatest joy. So I wanna end with a poem uh, that's in a beautiful book called The First Free Women. They are poems inspired by early Buddhist nuns. You always considered yourself lucky because things seem to work out the way you wanted. Now luck has a different meaning. Lucky to be walking a path that finds peace in the arising and passing away of each present moment, regardless of how things work out or don't. So thanks so much for your attention.